forward with the microprocess knee. Do you remember that? Um, you know, I've had the opportunity over in the Rayburn building to see some amazing advancements in upper extremity technology with, with neuromotor driven uh, prosthetic devices. And this gets back to one of the points I made in my opening statement. You seem to be not very satisfied with the overall relationship that the VA has with small businesses and express concerns about the inconsistencies in how they're treated by their local VA. How would this injured and amputee veterans bill of rights address some of that different treatment and help veterans get the type of care selection that you feel they deserve? Well, what happens is that the Bill of Rights is actually the rights that the VA already has in place for these amputees and, and orthotic patients. The problem is, is that the VA is not going out of its way to educate its, 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 its uh, patients on, on exactly their rights. They, they tend to just um, not let them know that they have the right to go outside the contract, to go to any provider they want to go to. They don't tell them that they have the right to have a microprocess knee or the latest technology. They don't tell them that they have a right to have a, a leg for the shower or the swim, you know. So I think what's happening is between what the national office saying the guy can have five legs and they can all be microprocessed if they want to, you know, and down to the visions, it doesn't communicate that way. I think the visions are being more controlled by the bean counters than the policy of the VA. And so they feel fearful to give these, these kind of products that cost a lot of money to these veterans. And also some of the new contracts that they put out. Now my company was contracted for the last 60 years with the VA. We just lost the contract. And some of the new contractors have never worked with VA patients, have never had a VA contract, do not have some of the qualifications required to put on microprocess knees or, or proprial feet or the new eye hand that you're talking about. So they're, they're limited. The VA is not going to order those parts if the contractor that they're dealing with doesn't even have the, the license to do it. But some of them do. You know, it's not all of them. But I, it's just that I think that the visions are, are just not giving the patient the, their rights. If, if the patient knows his rights, he, he'll be able to, you know, get done what he needs done. Captain, um... I first had uh, contact with Mr. Clark's business when one of my clients, a young man about your age, uh, had a below the knee amputation and an unguarded auger accident. And he was very concerned as a young man about his future and what types of mobility he would have as he progressed in his life. I was just hoping you might be able to share with us what a typical young veteran with a below the knee amputation or above the knee amputation goes through as you're trying to deal with planning for the rest of your life, coping with the rehabilitation process, and how vital the, the VA benefits are as you're going about that. Yes, there's, um, there's a couple different phases that, that the soldier, you know, that the veteran would go through. And the first is when you're transitioning from uh, DOD to VA. And uh, a lot of that depends on where you're transitioning to, what vision that you're, that you're heading to. Um, once you're in, in the VA system and you start to figure out, okay, what am I going to do with my life? And uh, that, that leg, getting that leg straight, getting that leg right is, is definitely your first priority. Um, and I think, I think that, you know, we, the nonprofits have a role to play and it, you know, maybe we should have thought about maybe representing that role a little bit too at, at this table. But a lot of these problems that happen in certain parts of the country have already happened where, where I'm at and we've already addressed them. And the way we're sharing lessons across the table is through these nonprofit organizations that are kind of there to, you know, just share lessons back and forth, meet with folks like this, talk to other vets, and uh, I think that's where, that's where we could maybe make it better for people in different parts of the country. And as, as you move out, I think they, uh, Mr. Down said, you know, maybe 800 amputees. So maybe we should expect to see about 40 amputees per state. And if there's three main clinics, you know, it's so like 
15 or 13 amputees in each state. Some of them are going to still be on active duty. Some of them are uh, still at Walter Reed. Some of them are not at the point in their health care yet where they're going in to see a processus. So when you break it down to the community level, you may only have, you know, two or three amputees that have walked through a clinic that sees 2,000 OIF, OEF veterans. And uh, without, you know, it's important to educate the patients, but we also need to be educating the folks that we're entrusting to kind of guide the patients through, through their care. And if you're going to see 2,000 vets, you know, if I was a case manager, I'd be worried first about PTSD because you're going to have a larger portion of that pile have issues with that than you are going to have amputees. And uh, getting the information to these folks about what programs are available for the amputees is where I think the, uh, you know, maybe the issue is. As far as the capabilities, as you go up your leg, as long as you have your knee, you're fine. You can do anything. Sky's the limit. And then as you start to go up a little bit higher, you know, life gets more challenging. 